It's a pleasure too to introduce um, Aditya Chakraborty um, this evening. Um, like many people um, and many other people, I expect that one of the main reasons I go to the Guardian uh, website is to read uh, Aditya Chakraborty. Um, and there are many reasons for, for, for doing that. Uh, one is because I'll always learn something about, um, in the case of the United Kingdom, the nuances of political debate or the, um, the implications of particular kinds of policies. That's to say, um, I read what he writes for information uh, and for uh, a better understanding through acquiring information. Um, but I also read him for other reasons. I, I read him uh, because of the uh, wit uh, and the incisiveness um, of his style. Um, I read him uh, because um, he uh, writes at a distance from the uh, trading of pompous cliches, which passes for political conversation um, uh, much of the time in the United Kingdom. And um, if you want an example of his wit and incisiveness at work, I recommend a very interesting piece that he published recently um, on the cult uh, that's growing up at the moment around the conservative politician uh, Rishi Sunak. Um, the other thing I think, uh, the other reason that I, I read his work is because of the fact uh, that I'm reading not simply an informed voice and uh, a, a witty and incisive uh, commentator, uh, but I'm also reading somebody with a commitment and uh, that commitment is to social justice. Uh, that commitment is to um, understanding the way um, in which um, the behavior of those that are politically powerful uh, can have all sorts of consequences, uh, most of them not good uh, for those who are not uh, powerful. Uh, that commitment in, in his work remains unswerving, it seems to me, and admirable. Um, He's won a number of awards for his work, um, including in 2017, the British Journalism Award uh, for uh, a Comment Journalism of the Year. And um, he's now working on his first book, which is going to be published this year, I think, by Penguin Alan Lane. Uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce him to you uh, tonight. And uh, the subject of his talk is, Before I Was Asian, I Was Black. Uh, personal reflections on this moment in anti-racist politics. And just to underscore a point that um, has, I think, already been made, if you want to um, ask questions um, after Ad uh, Aditya has finished uh, speaking, then please can you post them through the Q&A function um, on, the, on the website. So Aditya, over to you. John, thank you very much indeed uh, for that introduction. That's very, very generous of you indeed. Thank you. Um, before I begin on my talk, I just want to say I was invited to do this by Amit, uh, for which I'm very much obliged. Uh, I have been um, very concerned by the news this week from Ashoka University. Um, I can't pretend to know the facts of what's happened, uh, all the nuances and details, but we do expect our universities to defend free speech, free thought, no matter how uncongenial to political masters, to corporate donors, to prevailing fashions. Um, that, it seems to me, is part of what a university is for. Um, anyway, my talk. Uh, this is called Before I Was Asian, I Was Black. Before I was Asian, I was black. No, I have not undergone some miraculous change in pigmentation such as enjoyed by Michael Jackson. I have not doused myself in fair and lovely. I'm talking instead about how my family and others used to describe ourselves. I grew up in 1980s London where the streets still echo to the anti-Nazi League's chant of we are black, we are white, together we are dynamite. My mother was a primary school teacher and belonged to her trade union's Black Caucus, which claimed to speak for all teachers who face racism. My father, likewise, would congregate with colleagues from other parts of the Commonwealth, and they would all answer to the rough descriptor 
black lawyer. How far off that all now seems. Even now, for me to hear a phrase such as black caucus is, be, is to be transported back to chants of Maggie, 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 out, 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 of skinheads in bother boots telling us to go back where we came from, in rather less polite terms, um, of the first ever West Indian origin politicians getting elected to the House of Commons. That was only in 1987, as recent and as distant as life before email. It was, an in, it was an era in which the aforementioned Maggie Thatcher, the most electorally successful prime minister of the last century, described the UK as being swamped by people of a different culture. At this point, London was no capital of global finance, but was instead a city of dying factories and residents decamping to the countryside, to Europe, to Australia. The use of that particular use of the term black had long since faded by the mid nineties when I left home for university. Although even there, I was handed a copy of the Black Prospectus for black students published by, I believe, another black caucus. Among the highlights of the brochure were action shots of a Gujarati boy pointing at a college notice board. That sadly turned out to be a fair reflection of the entertainment on offer. Today, the very idea of someone of my ethnicity referring to themselves as black seems a joke. What I miss about that is not so much the term, but the politics it embodied. It was born of a recognition among those who'd recently arrived in the UK that they faced obstacles in common and would try and beat them together. One wore black, not instead of Jamaican or Sikh, but as well as those other labels of cultural and historical identity as a badge of anti-racist affiliation. And more besides, it was a movement that wouldn't settle for diversity, it demanded equality. Not merely representation, but transformation. The two things are not imposed, are, are not opposed, but in both cases, the first stops far short of the other. And the disappearance of that term, of that idea of political blackness, tells you a lot about what's gone wrong in race politics since. Now, this is, I know, a highly inconvenient time to making any such argument, especially in the UK. Why talk of losses when everyone else is totting up gains? When you cannot turn on the television, it seems to me, without seeing an advert for some supermarket or other featuring a, a black family tucking into that week's groceries. When every glossy magazine, the kind that sells cars and shoes, most articles about how white people can be better allies to their black friends. For a quarter of a century, race has been pretty much absent from black politics, yet today it's plastered all over our newspaper front pages and the subject of debate in Westminster, even apparently Buckingham Palace. There's much to celebrate here, not least the energy and inventiveness of the activists involved. A couple of weeks ago, in response to Meghan Markle's complaints about the tabloid's treatment of her as a mixed race woman, the Society of Editors released a statement that said, the UK media has a proud record of calling out racism. Now, this is the same UK media that I'm just gonna show you um, an example. Bring this up. Okay. I wonder, I'm trying to bring up my, just a, a couple of pictures. Okay. Ah. No, I've not, I'm not managing to do that. Um, it's the same UK media that regularly publishes front pages about how immigrants bring in disease and where the biggest selling tabloid ran a cartoon at the turn of the century, which showed um, men in uh, kutas marching across the border with rats following them. Within a few hours, a letter denouncing the statement had been signed by over 200 journalists of colour of whom, full disclosure, I was one. OK. 
Can you see me? Yeah. Right. The Society runs one of the UK's major journalism awards, which is soon coming up. The Black Host of the event withdrew. Journalists and news organisations announced they would boycott the ceremony. Within days, the head of the Society was out on his ear. It is quite possible the entire organisation will be broken up. Let me underline. These are the most powerful people in the British newspaper industry, media executives whose whims and prejudices keep prime ministers up at night. And here they are, made a laughing stock by a bunch of youngish activists, ethnic minority journalists and others, on their lunch breaks and a few people on the internet. This is the origin story for a number of today's political protests, a legitimate grievance with a clear focal point is given the caffeinated jolt of social media and suddenly there is chaos. Perhaps, one hopes, productive chaos. Now, what's wrong with that picture? Well, let's pull the camera back a little. Amid all the uproar on Planet Megan, my mind went to another story. In 2011, just before another royal wedding, that of Prince William to Kate, I wrote a piece about the people who cleaned Buckingham Palace. There were about two dozen of them in one trade union, mainly black African, and they were treated as little better than the dirt they cleaned. The staff were too frightened to talk publicly for fear of retribution, so in print I invented names. There was a guy I called Anthony. To get from his one bedroom bed to get from his one room bedsit to the palace of 52 royal bedrooms and 78 bathrooms was a journey of one and a half hours. When he got to work, men and women shared one room in which they had to change. They were asked to leave their coats in a storage room full of cleaning fluids, so that at the end of a shift, the coats reeked of chemicals. Stinking, exhausted, humiliated, Anthony would sit on his bus home among the tourists and school children. His wages for cleaning the London home of the Queen were just above the legal minimum. He'd wanted to go to college, royal pay was so low he was working another job and getting by on three hours sleep a night. While chatting I idly picked up his paperback, a fantasy novel with a dragon on the front. It was the sort of thing you meant to romp through in a few hours and forget about after minutes. Except Anthony had been lugging it around for months. He could never read more than a few pages at a time, he told me, otherwise my eyes start to burn. That's what happens, I suppose, when you never get enough rest. My piece made me the only journalist to write about the struggle of Anthony and his workmates and my newspaper, the only broadsheet to mention their poor treatment. This is not a boast. It's an indictment. What are we saying here? That racism only matters when it hurts a royal? That a cause lives or dies by whether it enjoys the oxygen of celebrity? or that linking race and class is now dead politics? I don't really know the answer. I do know this. On any given night in London before this pandemic, there were thousands of people like Anthony cleaning offices, serving security guards, washing up in the kitchens of restaurants and pubs, minding the sick and the elderly in care homes. Nearly all of these jobs will be low paid, the vast majority insecure, a significant number involve outright bad treatment. And the men? more often women working them, will almost all be from ethnic minorities. What is any social movement for racial equality today that doesn't have them at its heart? So here's a paradox. On the one hand, we have a media, especially a social media, that's collapsed the distance between us and celebrities such as Meghan Markle, or between us and those protesting in America the death of George Floyd. Our imagined communities now stretch further than we could ever have dreamt. Yet the result is often a politics that's narrower. The cry of the late 60s, early 70s used to be that the personal is political. Today, it seems that for any social movement to take off, the political must be personal. People must feel able to read themselves into the struggle to find their own biographies within it. When it comes to race politics in the UK, this dovetails with an older trend of the state funding groups, not on what they do, but on who they claim to represent. 
Whitehall, Whitehall has doled out money to the Muslim Council of Britain in the name of preventing terrorism. The writer Oren Kandani charts how Bradford City Council encouraged and funded local mosques to group together and provide an alternative voice for Muslims in the area. The hope was that they would become allies in the processes of absorbing opposition at the expense of the younger militants. It goes without saying that the younger militants were aggressively secular. This is just one example of how the state and then the media have shifted respectively money and focus from progressive anti-racist politics to older conservative ethnic politicians, from activists to self-proclaimed community leaders. Now let's see how these two forces work together. Today you're not, today you're either black or you're Asian. A categorical wall has been erect, erected and other divisions are hurriedly being thrown up. He is a Bangladeshi Muslim from Whitechapel. She is a Nigerian Christian, Christian from Lewisham. They get different fundings from their different London councils. They watch different television, they eat different food, they go to different places of worship, they mobilise around different causes. Never mind that they, they may both be working the same dead-end jobs, that they've both been knocked about by the same school system, that they now face the same struggle to find an affordable place to live and will face similar obstacles in advancing through the jobs market or even in dealing with the police. Never mind that both are far more likely to be struck down by COVID or to die as a result. The emphasis is upon ring fencing identities and celebrating the differences. What gets lost in the result? Well, for one, the long, stubborn, delightful, complex history of migrant politics in the UK, and anyone who cannot marshal a strong enough political or media presence. Two examples from just the past month. A woman from East London called Shamima Begum, who as a teenager left for Syria to marry an ISIS fighter, was finally stripped of her British citizenship on the grounds that she could apply for a Bangladeshi passport. She cannot come back here, even to face trial. No matter that Dhaka has already said it will give her no such passport. At the age of 21, she is effectively stranded. Public outrage? None. Also this month, it was revealed that a large company running holiday parks called Pontins had circulated a memo banning travellers from booking. Managers drew up a blacklist, including specific names such as Carney, Boylan, McGuinness. It was decorated with a wizard holding a wand and declaring, you shall not pass. As blatant example of discrimination, uh, as I've seen for a long time, and of course, the government dutifully condemned it. But outrage or even significant media coverage for the travellers themselves and the, the prejudices they face? None. Yet the travellers are, are perhaps the most bullied minority group in the UK. Again, What's the lesson from this? That bullying is fine as long as it's not us that are the victims? Because I don't think that there is, I really don't think there is a minority group in the UK as badly bullied as the travellers. And so the politics of anti-racism risk being supplanted by the politics of ethnic representation. Now, the first can encompass the second, but in the end, they are two different politics with two very different trajectories. The first is a cause, the second is an interest group. The first questions the connections between power and knowledge. The second can be a tool for the powerful, for the tick box classes. Consider the current uproar at Leicester University, where managers are trying to get rid of lecturers in Chaucer and Beowulf in the name of decolonizing the curriculum. In this case, decolonizing is no more than an alibi for the management, which also wants to lay off management studies academics for being too critical of modern managers. But ask yourself this question. If a political movement, a social movement, can be so readily exploited in this fashion, then what kind of movement is it? What kind of politics does it embody? Notice also how much the right enjoys this course, this discourse, since it enables them to deny that there is any such thing as racial inequality per se. Instead, there are left behind areas and disadvantaged groups. And wouldn't you know, among the most left behind of all are the white working class. 
How many times have we heard that phrase in the wake of Brexit and Donald Trump? And what an interesting phrase it is, white working class. Three words in which it's really only the first that matters. And even if you don't mind any of that, even if you argue that we shouldn't hold ourselves to impossibly high standards because conservatism never bothers with any cause beyond defending its own interests, then let's also admit that these new identities are utterly jer jerry built. I began by mentioning my mother who passed away last April. Today is actually her birthday, the first for which she will not be here. She was a primary teacher in inner London in that period when it was less well known for its fantastical house prices than its violent crime. To visit her staff room was to go on a whistle stop tour of the British Empire to see teachers from Trinidad, Nigeria, India, Pakistan, Cyprus, Ireland. All, I think, first generation immigrants to the UK, all women. And all aware that those two things in combination meant that they were not paid what they deserved and would likely be passed over for promotions. Now, today, my mother would be classed as Asian and one of her best friends, Lynette, black, even though Lynette was a Trinidadian Hindu who came with us to Pudja. Another friend, Dorothy, was from Ireland. Today, she might just about be termed BAME, an acronym for black and minority ethnic that hardly anyone seriously uses to describe themselves because it sounds like pure census speak. And yet my father would talk to Dorothy about Charles Stuart Parnell and Eamon de Valera and all the other Irish politicians he learned about during a boyhood in Bengal in a house where they studied Ireland's struggle for independence for clues to their own destiny. This is a very different model of culture exchange to the one left us by rigid identities engaged in their own competition about who has suffered most, a kind of oppression Olympics. On one hand, you have heterogeneity and complexity, on the other, homogeneity and simplicity. Perhaps it seems strange to use such words of race politics. But what it most often reminds me of is the way that people now consume culture. A couple of years ago, Harper's Magazine in America published a much discussed essay by the critic Christopher Lawrenson on how the internet had defected book reviewing and the discourse around literature. Lawrenson had been the literary critic at New York Magazine, but had lost his job when it decided criticism indeed challenge of all sorts, was less marketable than author profiles, the kind of thing that Amit talked about at the beginning. Lorentzen's piece is a kind of frontal assault on the algorithm and the feed. Literary discourse, he writes, now mimics the grammar of social media, the likable, the shareable, the trending, the quantifiable, the bite size. What we increasingly want out of culture and out of politics is a mirror and an echo. The great shadow of influence hanging over Lorentzen's piece was another article, this one four decades old. In 1980, the New Yorker magazine devoted most of its issue to uh, most of one of its issues to an essay by one of its staff writers, W.S. Trow. Called The Context of No Context, it was a strange incantatory piece preceding by aphorism and vignette. It was later published as a book and is now passed around as a kind of samizdat criticism of modern culture. Trow's subject was television and what it had done to the culture that he knew. Like Lorentzen, Trow could see right in front of him the erosion of his authority. Although as an East Coast wasp, he was altogether less self-pitying and rather more ambivalent about his entitlement to it. As a study in the transition of power, how power is shared out, how much is kept back, who defines the terms of transfer, it is exemplary. Last summer, as cities across America rose up in outrage at the police murder of George Floyd, the New Yorker once again published an essay on the passing of power. It was by its theatre critic, Hilton Owls. He wrote, at meetings and parties, one spends a great deal of time with people I call the collaborators. 
functionaries in service to power who will step on your neck to get to the next fashionable Negro who can explain just what is happening and why. When white America asks black artists in particular to speak about race, it's almost always from the vantage point of its being a sort of condition or plight. And if those collaborators can actually listen, what they really want to hear is, who are we in relation to you? Then Owls did something really interesting. He cited Trow's essay from 40 years earlier and quoted at length an important passage, which I want to read now. Trow writes, during the 1960s, a young black man in a university cl class described the Dutch painters of the 17th century as belonging to the white students in the room and not to him. This idea was seized upon by white members of the class. They acknowledged that they were at one with Rembrandt. They acknowledged their dominance. They offered to discuss at any length their inherited power to oppress. It was thought at the time that reactions of this type had to do with white guilt or white masochism. No, no, it was white euphoria. Many, many white children of that day felt the power of their inheritance for the first time in the act of rejecting it. And they insisted on rejecting it so that they might continue to feel the power of that connection. Had the young black man asked, who is this man to you? The pleasure they felt would have vanished in embarrassment and resentment. In Owls's hands, in the setting of his essay, that passage changed meaning. It was no longer a cry of despair at how little is known. Instead, it became an indictment at how America's hard ethnic categories, now being imported into the UK, allowed those in power to, consent, to condescend to those without, even when they themselves understood so little about their own culture. And I'll suggest that black people allow that to happen by not challenging those categories. I want to conclude with one last reference to my mother. When she arrived in this country in the late 60s, she came armed. She had read Shakespeare, Hardy, Hazlitt. She'd been taught by a student of Harold Lasky. Few people she met in London knew who he was, even though he ranked as one of the LSE's most interesting political theorists. As for the poetry, the golden treasury, forget it. Blank English faces from here to Highgate. Never mind. My mother had never read any of those people to qualify to live here or to learn how to fit in, any more than she'd taken up Tolstoy with a view to moving to the Russian countryside. It was the world's culture it was her culture. And like her, I see no reason to fit inside any pigeonhole unless I make it myself. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ati. That was a, that that was a fascinating talk. Um, fascinating talk. Um, I'm get oh good. Sorry, I was just getting some echo back then. Um, so, uh, Aditya, I, do you have time to take a few questions or responses to, to what you've just said? Um, yes, very much so, yeah. Good. Um, can, can I start by just um, trying to uh, probe a bit further the, um, well, the, the contours of the loss that you're describing and, and what it's caused? Um, it, I mean, for example, if I could just raise the, go back to the case of the United Kingdom and the atmosphere that you described in the 1980s. Um, was a, a, an important component in that um, solidarity that you described the fact that there was still an active trade unionism? Um, <clears throat> that's a... That's a really good point. Trade, the trade union's role in uh, anti-racism, um, in forming identities around race, is a highly troubled one. Um, oftentimes you had uh, black and Asian workers who struggled for representation within their own trade unions. Um, 
in one particular very famous case, um, there were East African Asian women working in a photo processing plant uh, in West London called Grunwick, uh, who uh, went on strike and found that their strike uh, was not fully supported by the trade union movement. There were a few breakaway trade unionists like Arthur Scargill, who came out and sort of picket line with them, but actually they had none of the the wider support of the trade union movement. Um, and so part of the story of the 80s and 90s, and, and in fact, it goes on now, it goes on now, John, um, is trade unions struggling to, to, to accommodate and to, to give voice to their own members who are from ethnic minorities. But I think going behind what you say, the trade unions were important outside race in being part of a kind of civil society that was able to talk about alternatives, um, which I think is what you're, 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 you're kind of, uh, you're, you're casting for is the kind of the big point. And I agree with you there. Um, both the Labour Party as it, as it stood then and trade union movement were, um, well, for one thing, it's hard to, it's, it, it's, it's, it's hard to, um, to fathom now how far trade unions extended into civil, into civil society, how large their membership was. Um, but it's also hard to reconcile how even the Labour Party, which was even then starting to become more conservative in its politics, how still it was, it stood in opposition to Thatcherism and to the kind of social settlement that Thatcher represented. That's all gone by the bias in. So, so part of what's gone in that idea of political blackness is the idea that you could have an alternative society. And there I do agree with you that the, the, the retreat of unions, the, the, uh, the, the loss of a backbone by the Labour Party um, over the last 40 years, they've definitely played a part. Thank you. Um, there are some, some other comments and questions coming through on the Q&A and on the chat. Perhaps I should raise uh, one of them here. It's from Paul Deb, who um, recognises the experiences you referred to in your talk um, and wonders if you saw the seeming proliferation of specific cultural identities, perhaps most clearly expressed in ideas of intersectionality, as denying shared experiences of prejudice and their basis in economic reality. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. That question is, yeah. <laughs> that's a very good summary of uh, what I've just spent 11 yes. pages talking about. Yeah, thank you very much for that. <laughs> it, still begs, it still begs a very important question, which has to do with the denial of the Yeah, I mean, what, one of the things that really does strike me about it is, um, is, is thinking about the women in my mother's staff room, right? they had very good politics um and yet they didn't use big big p political words to describe them i think my mother my mother did describe herself as socialist but she wouldn't have gone along you know terms like decolonization would have meant the british leaving india which by the way my mother chiefly remembered for being given sweets at school playtime on that very day um but and words like intersectionality would have been it's just it's just not something you would be using in the context of staff room. And yet the the understanding of how sex and uh, ethnicity and class and where you were located in, in 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 employment, how those things played into each other, the kind of kids that you dealt with, why it was that the staff room, uh, the, the staff room in a very tough area of London, then Hackney, um, why it was that they were all staffed with first generation migrants, pretty much. The understanding was absolutely instant. You didn't need to dress it up in terminology. Um, and I, I, I really regret the way that terms like intersectionality have come along, even though I can understand where they come from. But I regret how they've come along to, as a kind of throat clearing exercise to try and find the commonality between me and someone like Lynette Huber, my mother's friend who I mentioned. And, and that I really regret. Thank you. Are there other responses, comments from? Just check on the. But it's rather difficult because I need to check the chat and the Q and A. 
There's one from Harjo. Oh no, in section that was what you were quoting, yeah. Yes, it's the same. I think it's the same thought on the on the um, well, I suppose the negative consequences of intersectionality. Um, now there's an I think there's something else that's come come through. Um, oh, it's from uh, Shapali Frost who asks um, whether a same phenomenon in a more exaggerated way is being played out in modern India vis-a-vis -vis minorities and. Um, I don't know, if, Aditya, if you've got any thoughts on that or if any other. I mean, the um, what's really striking um, about uh, now, I, I only I, I follow India through newspapers um, and websites rather than anything else, so I, I can't claim to be to be up close to it. But what what is interesting when, when I look across to India um, is how some of the same maneuvers and strategies are being followed around minority definition of minority who gets to be called oppressed or not and and the the one that stands out is the one about uh patels and patels being classified as being other backward castes um which i think if if the british could come up with uh, 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 an, an OBC category for the UK, they, you could bet your bottom dollar that they would put the white working class in it. If only they could find the right catch, for, you know, the, the, the right category of surnames that they would put into it, uh, they would, that, that you would get some of the same thing, that, that there are these protected characteristics. What there is going on in kind of counterpoint to, to that, to, to some of the stuff that you see in India is, um, this discovery of left behind areas um, where certain parts of the UK are held to be particularly disadvantaged and in need of money, it just so happens that those left behind areas are um, the particular focus of um, uh, electoral concern by our Conservative government. So they're, they're reporting money quite nakedly to, 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 to parliamentary seats that they want to win. Um, and I think what both cases, the one that one I quoted in India and the thing about left behind areas here, tell you is about how quickly, once you define a, an area disadvantage, how quickly you mobilize that for political purposes and how quickly you, you, you use that as a kind of receptacle to, 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 to get money in. Thanks again. I think we're going to need to come to a, an end fairly soon um, because we have an, an hour for the session. Um, let me just have a last check and see if there's anything more. Oh, yes, there's an interesting question here, which I think, uh, Ahmed, sorry, uh, Adit, you're very interested to hear your thoughts on. Uh, and this is a question about social media as a platform for protest. I, I can't see it on mine. Um, it's in the Q&A. I'm in the chat. Yeah, if you move to Q&A. Oh, hang on. <laughs> Have you got that? I'm, hang on. No. Oh, well, I'll, 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 ah, here we are. Question to you. Yeah, sorry, I'm right. You're, you're completely right. Any thoughts about social media as a platform for protest? Is that the right, is that the right one, John? Yeah, that's the one. Maybe compared to the old slog of political activism, consensus building, long-term strategic thinking. Um, Thank you very much, uh, who, who, whoever asked that, P. McD, uh, for our, our asking that question. That's, um, that's a very good question. And there is definitely something to it. Um, social media is very good for building thin communities which stretch very wide in the, in the way that I, I was suggesting in, in some of that. And for acting as a, a, a microphone for a particular easily defined uh, protest. It's one of my friends, um, there was a question about trade unions um, earlier. One of my friends um, was the head of a trade union, a small trade union in the UK that represented, that, that, that represented migrant workers in particular, migrant workers in universities uh, in particular. Uh, so the cleaners at the University of London, security guards, porters, and so on. Um, and 
one of the things he pointed out to me was that if you ever, uh, about the, the nature of his work, one of the things he pointed out to me was that if you ever got a CEO of a company on a mic that had been left on after an interview, and he'd ever said, you know, what we ought to do is really make sure that black and brown workers get paid a lot less, that they don't get the same entitlements as the uh, the, the, the white work workforce, that um, you'd immediately get social media uproar about that. And yet he said, the point is that that process is actually going on uh, in the workplaces where he's trying to organise the entire time. It's just that as a process, it's much harder to, 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 to see by naked eye. So there's, there's something about how you need a particular, really glaring specific example, which no one can deny, which has got all the photos attached to it and so on, all the all this kind of very literal stuff that now goes into um, successful social media. And then there is, as the question points out, the kind of the, the, the failure to reach out beyond uh, the community, the thin community created by social media um, to actual social organization, to, 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 to meeting other people, to listening to people in particular rather than just talking over them. Um, social media is very good for talking over other people and very bad for listening to people. But, the, but one of the things I do just want to say to argue against myself a little bit and to argue against that question is we do have bodies uh, which are meant to be in civil society. So we have political parties that are meant to be in civil society and that are meant to not just to live on social media. We have trade unions, we have churches, we have all sorts of um, institutions in the UK which are meant to be part of civil society and could act as uh, organisers, mobilisers of popular discontent. It's really striking to me now to see that how far political parties in particular have got no real roots in civil society anymore and you've seen that very clearly over the course of the pandemic that politics retreated to something that was held first in Westminster and then over Zoom reaching into the House of Commons. Actually the Labour Party which claimed to which claims to be the, the, the popular party that on side of the masses did very little in terms of organising around Covid they didn't open up food banks, they didn't uh, help uh, defend uh, renters in private uh, housing, which became a, a big flashpoint. Um, th they did very little, indeed. It's also worth remembering that at one point, the Conservative Party was the biggest political party in the UK, it had the biggest membership. Um, now it's got a membership of something like 70,000. Its roots in civil society have withered away to nothing. So we've got a kind of double problem in which you've got social media, which sometimes looks like it's somehow the authentic voice of civil society at some points, and yet isn't. And then you've got the the you've got the the long-established institutions which used to be part of civil society also retreating, uh, unable to command the kind of legitimacy and authority that they once did as being voices of, of, of civil society and unwilling also to engage with it. And, and this was true no matter whoever the leader of the Labour Party was. You know, it was, it's as true of Keir Starmer, the current leader of the Labour Party, as it was of Jeremy Corbyn, unfortunately, the previous leader of the Labour Party. It doesn't matter what politics you, you bring to the party. It is the case that Labour Party is this now very um, removed or, um, institution that people trot out to vote for perhaps every four years and that's it. Hmm. Could I come back to that and reframe it in the form of, a, of, a, of another kind of question or another perspective? Mm. Um, are you describing a crisis therefore in national institutions? I mean if you think about I'm sorry, I'm getting a lot of feedback. Um, the Labour Party is an, a national party, the Conservatives is a national party. I mean, uh, I'm interested in the relationship, if you like, of, of civil society to the nation here and whether it, it coheres with a national politics in the way that it once did. Um. I'm sure 
I'm sure I'm sure there's something to that, John, except don't forget the Labour Party is broken down to constituency parties. So there are local organisations for each and every Labour Party. So they, they can go and do their own thing if they want. We have um, devolved administrations. It's not really clear to me that the Welsh government is seen as massively more um, legitimate than the Westminster government. I mean, if you go to, to Wales, they'll often talk about the, the Welsh government has been those people in, in Cardiff Bay, you know, that particular sock of the country below Cardiff. Um, local councils too. One of the things that really strikes me is how little, um, little trust people have in local councils. It's not just that they don't know who their local councillor is, it's that they, they, they see their local council as being a, a largely punitive force. I think a I mean, I, I think a, a couple of different things have happened. One is obviously spending cuts have happened in large force over the last 10 years, which means that your local council, your local school, your local hospital just can do less for you than it once did. Um, the other thing that's gone with that is a kind of attitude of punishment, that if you go to your local council for help you have to fill in forms which are 30 pages long and you're going to be treated with a certain amount of distrust if you want housing well you're waiting 10 years for, for housing from local council so and they, they they will you know they will go through your your uh entitlement to it with a magnifying glass to try and find reason why they shouldn't give it to you that's one thing the other thing that's obviously happened is that some of those institutions along the way have not been affected by uh, spending cuts in the same way, but they're seen now as being, um, as being uh, that, that they've shed some of their social ob obligations or they've shed their rootedness in community. I mean, since this is being, uh, uh, this, this, this symposium is, is being facilitated by a university. I mean, the universities in the UK have become brands over the past 10, 15 years. Uh, brands um, which are increasingly less about the promotion of education uh, as they are about facilitating the student experience, which is what vice chancellors uh, now like to talk about when you when you when you open their brochures. Um, so in a variety of ways, the, the kind of institutions that one used to look to that would represent local civil society, national civil society, are both retreating from it, um, which is why I think there is this kind of, um, there is this kind of uh, move towards social media by some, some of these groups which previously would have felt they didn't have a voice. Social media with all of its constraints and problems. But I don't even think there that people are really that taken in. I don't think anyone actually thinks that Mark Zuckerberg or who, whoever it is who now runs Twitter, you know, are, are their friends. I don't think they see those as anything more than platforms that, which are just handily convenient. I don't think there's an awful lot of faith in them as being a new kind of public square, as it were. I think there's just a general sense that there isn't a public square. And, and that, to some extent, is what brings this all round back to this issue about how, how identities are formed in, in the lack of a public square, in the lack of a sense of a collective endeavour, collective struggle, you have this walling off into ever smaller identities. Mm. Yeah. W one other question that's come through on the uh, chat and Q&A, I think, is um, why does migration exacerbate the human plight on the identity front? A question about migration, it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts on that. Peter. Why does let me? Why does my migration exacerbate the human plight on the identity front? I'm I'm never quite sure whether it is actually migration that um, that that is particularly troublesome, or whether it's the lack of um, care that's given to properly integrate migrants into the rest of society. Um, I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example from, 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 from my own upbringing. So the, 
I, I was brought up in uh, a particular part of North London where I pretty much live still. Um, I live two and a half miles from where I grew up. Um, in 2001, uh, the area in which I grew up, in 2001, the census showed it as being two thirds white. By 2011, the next census, uh, the, the, it was shown to be two thirds non-white. Huge change in just, in just 10 years. Um, we had a um, conservative council in charge for a large part of that. The deputy leader of the council referred to the area in which I grew up as being akin to a UN feeding station because it was so full of minorities who were not very rich. Um, I spoke to one of the largest my ethnic minorities. Uh, um, I've done a lot of kind of research around the new ethnic minorities which have taken up home in the area in which I used to live. One of the biggest groups is Bulgarians. One of the guys I spoke to had uh, been um, uh, one of the longest standing immigrants to uh, the area. So he'd been there before the EU um, uh, had opened up to its borders to Bulgaria. And he said to me, you know, before I came to Britain, I'd spent a few years in Germany. In Germany, um, he said, we were given bicycles by uh, the local uh, um, local church, uh, and we were taught um, in a month how to fit into local society. We were given all the various tools about how the schools work, how the health system works, what you do with this, that, and the other. We were given all of that, and we learned it all within a month. And he said, coming to this country, no one told us anything. It took us a year to learn the same things um, as we learned in a month in Germany. And there's no, I mean, it goes without saying, there's no provision for, there's barely any provision for English language teaching in that area, despite the fact that you've got hundreds, yeah, easily well over 100 different languages now being spoken there. Uh, and a lot of people who don't speak English that well. But there's no provision for English language teaching. There's no provision for citizenship training. You know, none of those sorts of things about how the local welfare system works or how the council works. No, no, no none of that works. It, what you get instead is a kind of form of, uh, well, you could call it Chinese whispers. You might also call it Turkish whispers or Bulgarian whispers or, or whatever, because you get different minority groups which are telling each other how the system works. Um, and very little kind of interfacing with uh, the local arm of the state, the local council, let alone the national arm of the state. Um, and all of this is exacerbated by the fact that if you want to get your entitlements nowadays in the UK, you have to use computers. And obviously a lot of people who are new, new to the country who don't necessarily have a lot of money, they don't have the data to fill in a 30 page form to get basic, a, a low level of benefit. And yet this is part of what happens the entire time. So I, I'm not sure it's m migration per se, or, or, although obviously migration does pose an issue, but it's not an ins insoluble problem. I, I, can't, I can't see it as such. Um, one of the welcome things that has happened, I think, within my lifetime, and, and by the way, I, in my talk, I concentrated on, on trying to form an argument and trying to provoke a, a discussion. Um, there are other things which I could point to as, as as much more grounds for optimism. One of the things is is that in in my childhood, um, there the the public discussion about migrants was they had to choose whether to integrate or assimilate. Um, and um, for instance, I, I wasn't taught Bengali at home by my two Bengali parents because um, the orthodoxy at the time was that if you taught their child taught a child their mother tongue, they'd get very confused when it came to learning English. That thing about, you know, you have to choose to integrate, you can't, you know, you, in fact, you should ideally assimilate. Uh, you shouldn't learn your own language. You shouldn't carry around bits of, uh, you know, any cultural, any other cultural trappings. I think that's all gone, which is a good thing. The problem is that there's been no new dialogue about um, how you then interface with society, with state, um, where, how you get your entitlements, 
how this country best uses the immense wealth of talent and languages and knowledge that people bring to this country. Um, th there's no dialogue about that. They're seen as, as they're, they're seen as a problem to be managed still. Thank you. Um, I think we need to bring the session to a close now. Uh, we're at the hour. Um, thank you very much, Aditya, for, for a very thought-provoking uh, presentation and uh, response to the questions too. Um, th it's, it's very interesting when you have a discussion which identifies something that once existed in the past and has gone missing and raises a question about what's missing now. And it's very difficult to describe what's missing now, but I think you've, you've provided a very good sort of, because of course, going back to the past is not going to be the way of, of finding the solution to what's missing now. It's as though there's a, there's a further sort of stage in the invention of social institutions in the invention of ways of, of talking to each other, which we haven't quite got to yet. And I think your talk has, has illuminated that very, very, uh very well it's 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 um a very good beginning to the to the symposium so so on behalf of everybody who's listening and and um contributing to the discussion thanks very much indeed so thank you Aditya. and there's a 15 minute break now is there can we make it a 10 minute break i think that should be fine 10 minutes yeah break. okay so um in, in India, it is now six o'clock, is it? Yes. So come back at 10 past six. Yeah. Good. Okay. Thanks very much. Well done, Aditya. That was really great. That was good. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Enjoyed yeah. that very much. Looking forward to the written up uh, the transcript no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. honestly yeah. how much value how much value are you getting out of me can i ask what the book is going to be about yeah it's about um yes th thank you john it's about where i where i grew up oh. it's about areas so it's called um the the area in which i grew up is called edmonton is called edmonton uh it's about a hundred thousand people Mm -hmm. um it's gone through massive massive change even within my own lifetime i'm i'm 46 um and it used to be where mk electric thorny mi ripple um where the first light bulb electric light bulbs were mass produced um i mean a, a massive hub of light industry that um that has all just gone along with you know, industry across manufacturing industry across the UK. And yet London, first of all, tends to forget about its light industrial past, however recent it was. But also um, because it is in London, because this area is in London, it's it's got all these London problems. So there's huge pressure on housing. Um, and in a way, instead of becoming a kind, of, instead of it being once it's kind of, kind of productive working class prosperity, which also it did accept, however begrudgingly, migrants uh, to live in the cheap houses, um, it's become a place of kind of working class poverty. Um, and the it's turned into kind of banlieue along the, the kind of lines that, that you see in Paris. So right. all the problems that were once in a city have just moved to places like Edmonton without, it seems to me, very much discussion of how that's happened, why that's happened, what the effects of that are. So the borough in which I live, London Borough of Enfield, uh, has the second highest serious youth violence in London, second only to Westminster, which has got Soho. Uh, Edmonton has got the biggest sex work industry in London, bigger than King's Cross used to be. Okay. Um, it's the Edmonton is the evictions hotspot of England, and on and on, like a whole series of these problems in an area of only a hundred thousand people, right at the tip of uh, North North London. Um, and because it's 
now a Labour stronghold, has been for, for decades, um, it doesn't really have much of a political voice. And, it, and because it's on the outskirts of London, it doesn't really get seen in the same way. Um, so uh, it, what I'm trying to do is to try and kind of tell the story of the area kind of with it over the course of my lifetime mm. um, and through the lives of people who live there now. So it's kind of, the, the idea is it's, it's largely reporting, it's not polemical, um, but with bits of analysis and context kind of along the way to show how these are not just Edmonton problems, but these are also London problems, Britain problems as well. Um, it's It's been quite a fraught process trying to do reporting over the pandemic yeah. uh, and trying to see people and all the rest of it. And uh, as I said in my talk, you know, things have been derailed by the death of my mother and then we had a, a baby uh the month afterwards so, so we've now got two very small children but uh I've, it's kind of coming along bit by bit i'm hopeful that at least this year i'll get um a draft done or get most of a draft done uh we'll see thanks for asking